Hi everyone, my name's Walter, and I'm back here with a subject I haven't talked about in a very long time. Elliot Rogers, the subject that got me my first thousand subscribers on my first channel, and we're finally coming back to it. Elliot was known as the patron saint of the incels back when I covered him. No idea if that's still true, but probably. Now what Elliot did to his victims wasn't funny or anything, but Elliot himself was a real cringe lord. And all these events we never would have known about are all detailed in my twisted world, his 137 page so-called manifesto. I am just going to list some of the most shameful events from St. Elliot's life. So let's get into it with Elliot Rogers' most shameful moments. Prince Zuko is my favorite character. I always related to him. No, I'm just kidding. Everything on this list is way more shameful than that. I just wanted to point out that Elliot said that. Okay, so here's one of my favorite moments from my twisted world. Elliot trying to convince his mom to get married to a rich guy so he doesn't ever have to work. And yes, he was an adult already. I found out that my mother was actually dating Jack, the wealthy man who owned the Malibu beach house. I always thought he was only her friend. My mother never told me or my sister about any men that she dated. She always kept that strictly private. I hadn't even met Jack yet. He was worth well over $500 million, and he owned other mansions in Bel Air and Beverly Hills. When I found out about this, I started to harbor the hope that my mother will get married to this man and I will be part of a rich family. That will definitely be a way out of my miserable and insignificant life. Money would solve everything. I started to frequently ask my mother to seek marriage with this man, or any wealthy man for that matter. She always adamantly refused and demanded that I stop talking about it. She told me that she never wanted to get married again after her experience with my father. I told her that she should sacrifice her well-being for the sake of my happiness, but this only offended her further. I cannot even imagine trying to tell my mom to do something like this. And how do you tell someone to sacrifice their well-being for the sake of your happiness anyway? My favorite part was walking through the store Harrods. Harrods is a gigantic, renowned luxury designer clothing store. Every facet of it exuded beauty and excessive opulence. It was my type of place. I wished I was rich enough to buy anything I wanted at the store. There were so many choices of fabulous clothing, but alas, I had to settle with buying only one Giorgio Armani shirt. If my mother had been wise enough to marry one of those wealthy men she dated, perhaps then I would have been rich enough. Such a pity. The house had a swimming pool and was located in a nice enough area, though I would have still preferred it if my mother had gotten married to a wealthy man and moved into a mansion. I still continued to pester her to do this and she still stubbornly refused. I will always resent my mother for refusing to do this. If not for her sake, she should have done it for mine. Joining a family of great wealth would have truly saved my life. I would have a high enough status to attract beautiful girlfriends and live above all of my enemies. All of my horrific troubles would have been erased instantly. It is very selfish of my mother to not consider this. Yes, Elliot, your mother is the selfish one here. Definitely sounds like it. Well, that's enough of that subject. Another favorite is the time that he listened to his sister having sex with her boyfriend. I eventually grew to hate him after I heard him having sex with my sister. I arrived at the house one day, my mother being at work, and heard the sounds of Samuel plunging his penis into my sister's vagina through her closed room door, along with my sister's moans. I stood there and listened to it all. So my sister, who was four years younger than me, managed to lose her virginity before I did. It reminded me of how pathetic I was, that at the age of 22 I was still a virgin. I hated her boyfriend as well. My sister said that he's been with other girls before her, and I'm sure he lost his virginity at a much younger age. It is such an injustice. The slob doesn't even have a car, and he is able to get girlfriends while I drive a BMW and get no attention from any girls whatsoever. It's like he lives in the same world as Lucas, where cars are only status symbols that you use to get girls. But what the hell, Elliot? Also, he hates this guy for being half Mexican, because of course he does. Okay, let's talk about Leo Bubenheim. Yes, that's his name. He was the kid that Elliot was most jealous of. Well, kid as in four years younger than Elliot, who always obsessed over how young people were. In the spring, something horrible happened that will haunt me forever. We met up with the Bubenheims at the Sagebrush Cantina in Calabasas, and a friend of Polina's was there with them named Nicole, a girl around my age. She sat next to Leo the whole time, and by the end of the dinner, the two of them were making out. Twelve-year-old Leo was making out with a girl who was almost my age. Not only does Leo have a better social life, but now he was making out with girls, at age 12. They made out for a long time, and I could see them tongue kiss. They knew I was watching with envy, and they still did it. I bet that lucky bastard took great satisfaction from my envy. There I was, watching a boy four years younger than me experience everything I've longed for. To kiss a girl. To be worthy of a girl's attraction. On that day, I developed a vicious hatred for Leo that will never go away. 
Elliot likes to watch. Elliot, you don't have to get jealous over a 16-year-old who's making out with a 12-year-old. Come the fuck on. Also, here's another Boobenheim story. Another horrible experience concerning the Boobenheims occurred. We were having dinner at their house like we usually did. At the end of the dinner, a few of Polina's friends came over. They were all popular, good-looking girls and boys. They were the kind of people who I've always had the desire to be a part of, but was never able to fit in with. Popular kids. Cool kids. When I heard them talking about their awesome lives and their parties, I had a breakdown right then and there. I realized how much I've been missing out on in my life, and I cried in front of everyone. I felt like I would never have a life as good as theirs. I told everyone that I wanted to commit suicide. Father, Sumaya, Alex, and Karina talked to me for three hours to cheer me up. You've got to wonder what they thought about Elliot after events like this. In their perspective, he probably just threw a tantrum out of nowhere. It's not like he can ask his parents to fix his social life. Though his mom did set up playdates for him at least until he was 17, which is also hard to imagine. So Elliot had a history of getting drunk and out of control at parties. You kind of feel for him because he had a lot of social anxiety until he drank, but then he always drank too much and made a scene. Let's look at a few more parties. Addison invited me to his birthday party. It was a small get-together on the beach in Point Doom, Malibu. I had a very hard time socializing with people, so I ended up drinking too much alcohol. Before Philip drove me home, I vomited outside Addison's apartment, in front of his mother and everyone else. It was highly embarrassing, and I put a lot of effort to block it from my mind afterwards. Psh, that's not that bad. Sounds like what I would have done. Let's go deeper. There were a few girls at our table, daughters of Rob's friends. One of them was pretty. I believe she was the daughter of Pietro Scalia, a renowned film editor. She had very sexy eyes and she was tall. I always had a thing for tall girls, and this one was almost taller than me. I had to suffer watching Julian sweet-talk all of the girls. He acted so confidently, and the way the pretty girl looked at him with those sexy eyes of hers, that was a look that no girl ever gave to me. I could tell that she was attracted to him. I became more enraged with each second I had to suffer through this. The girls treated me like I was invisible, but they all paid attention to Julian. What made it even worse was that Julian was a year younger than me, and he acted like an obnoxious prick, but the girls liked it. The more enraged I became, the more wine I drank. James was probably worried about how angry I was getting, and he tried to strike up random conversations with me to distract me from Julian. It was very hard to help myself from getting up and dumping my wine all over Julian's stupid head. Perhaps I would have, if the birthday cake wasn't presented so early. Everyone stood up to sing happy birthday to Rob, and then the meal was over. Some of the guests left, and James and I switched to a different table. By the time the party was over, I had consumed eight glasses of that 1985 wine. I was underage, but no one seemed to notice me drinking. I was literally stumbling out of the restaurant. You know, Elliot always complained about girls ignoring him, but there's a good reason for it. He never tried to interact with them at all. He thought that if he just sat there and tried to act cool and aloof, that they would come talk to him. This other guy was being popular with the girls because he was willing to try talking to them. Also, Elliot claims this wine was probably over a thousand dollars a bottle, and he's mostly drinking a bunch of it despite his dad. God forbid you say something to someone's face instead of being passive-aggressive. I didn't have dinner before the party because I expected dinner to be served there. When we got there, I saw that they didn't offer dinner, only a few party snacks, but there was lots and lots of wine. I heard from Ancha that Vincent was in town, but he was attending a party at Leo Bubenheim's house with all of Leo's popular teenage friends. The mere mention of Leo put me in a bad mood. I couldn't believe that Vincent, too, was now experiencing the pleasures of partying with young people while I sat all alone at the adults' party, sipping my wine in lonely depression. I should be partying with my own friends and my own girlfriends, but I had none. After I had already gotten quite drunk from having so much wine on an empty stomach, I overheard Ancha talking to her friend about how Vincent now had a beautiful girlfriend. She was so proud of her son. That is something my mother was never able to tell her friends about me. I had never had a girlfriend in my whole life. I remember when Vincent used to be a little 9-year-old boy while I was 13. He used to look up to me, and he always watched me play my online games on father's laptop. Now he was 16 and I was 20. He had the pleasure of having a girlfriend while I've never had one. I was 4 years older than him, but he surpassed me. The envy, rage, and feeling of inferiority I felt almost made me explode with rage right there at the party. But instead I went to the bathroom and vented to myself in the mirror of how much I hate Vincent and wanted to kill him. I drank a lot more wine that night, pouring myself glass after glass. By the time Vincent arrived after his party at Leo's, I greeted him with drunken contempt and drank even more wine. I drank too much. On the next morning I thanked the heavens that at the end of the party I had the sense to go to the bathroom to vomit instead of vomiting in front of everyone. That would have been extremely embarrassing. 
Yeah, that would have been so embarrassing, unlike getting too drunk and ranting at the bathroom mirror about someone who never did anything to you. Elliot, the worth of a man isn't defined by whether he can get a relationship. It's a man's worth that makes women want him in the first place. Anyway, you can see that he was just about to explode any time he saw young, attractive couples. I think I have time for one more moment of shame, though this one's a lot longer than a moment. This is the last time they tried to take him to Morocco, which is where Sumaya's family was. Sumaya is his stepmom and probably the most sympathetic person in the story. I spent the remaining five days at father's house. While there, I chose not to protest at all because I knew it wouldn't work. They will force me onto that plane one way or another. I decided to keep quiet and devise a plan of escape. I bided my time and didn't talk much to father or Sumaya during those last few days. The plan I came up with was to run away on the morning before the flight, walk all the way to my mother's condo and hide in a secret spot on the roof. It would be a place where they least expected me to be. I kept quiet in the last couple of days to throw off their suspicion, but that backfired and made them even more suspicious. I suppose they expected me to protest about going, and my silence made them think I was up to something. When the time came, I decided to get up at 4 a.m. to prepare. To my dismay, I noticed that my father set an alarm on the front door. I was planning to run away at 6 a.m. when the garbage truck arrived, because the noise from the truck would mask any noise I make while leaving. The alarm, however, would definitely alert Father and Sumaya. I got too nervous and abandoned that idea. Instead, I waited until everyone woke up and had breakfast. My plan was ruined by the alarm and I had to come up with a new plan fast. I had little time left. I innocently told Father I wanted to go on a small walk before the departure, and as soon as I exited the front door, I bolted at full speed. It was hasty, but I had to do something. I didn't think Father would catch on to my deception so quickly. After only clearing one block, I looked behind my shoulder and saw Father chasing after me. All of my hope collapsed then and there, and I lost all of the fight in me. I stopped running and put my head down in defeat. Sumaya came in the car minutes later, and they both took me home. The plan failed. I was going to Morocco. I think that's actually Abby's favorite part of my Twisted World, and I can kind of see why. It's an example of how he dealt with everything in his life. He looks back, sees some adversity, and just gives up. And he always gives up. Oh, there's a couple in my class? I guess I have to drop it. And I'm not saying I wish he would have done this, but he also shot himself instead of shooting at the police. That's kind of like giving up too. Okay, let's finish this trip because it gets even more shameful when he gets there. The journey to Morocco was the most horrendous travel experience I've ever had. It was just me, Sumaya, and four-year-old Jazz. Jazz kept screaming and vomiting on the plane. Sumaya was in a sour mood, and I was completely miserable. I thought my whole life was all over. I had nothing to look forward to in the future. I wanted to die. Once I got there, I felt like all the life in me had drained out. I was so defeated. I couldn't help but cry all the time, even in front of Sumaya's relatives. Kataja didn't understand why I was so upset, and she got offended that I was crying on the first day at her house. It was a complete disaster. I kept dreaming of home. I thought of the prospect of being able to return home, and a small hope sparked in me. I kept emailing my mother frequently, telling her how much I hated being there and how much I cried all the time. I told her that if she would give me one more chance and enable me to come home, I will try harder to lead a better life and to become a person she could be proud of. After a week of doing this, mother gave in and flew to Morocco to take me home. I won. I was going home. God damn, he was almost 18 at this point. Not even sure how you can cry for an entire week straight. Elliot really had some problems he had to deal with. You might notice I didn't use a lot of the more well-known moments. I like being a little different. However, there's going to be a part two where I'll cover the college party. You probably know the party. But that is about all the time I have for you today. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you liked the video, please give it a like. If you have something to say, please let me hear it in the comments. I read all the comments for the first day or so, and give out so many hearts they essentially mean nothing. If you're new here and want more content from me, consider subscribing. I'd also like to thank my generous patrons. They help me out with direct support, and I really appreciate it. Anyway, I think this is a safe subject now, so I wanted to do it. Definitely let me know if it was any good. Have a great day, everyone, and at least try to outrun your dad. That was just sad. Hey, everyone, this is Walter, and I'm back here with something I promised. I recently made a video about Elliot Rogers' most shameful moments, and believe me, there are more than enough for another video. I'll link to part 1 in the description, but last time we covered Elliot trying to convince his mom to marry a rich man, Elliot listening to his sister having sex with her boyfriend, Elliot making an ass of himself at parties, and Elliot crying for a week straight on a trip to Morocco. So we're off to a good start.
let's begin with Elliot Rogers' Most Shameful Moments Part 2. So we're going to start this off with one of his best known moments, the party he tried to go to as a last resort so he wouldn't have to carry out his day of retribution. This happened a few days before he turned 22, the oldest age he would ever reach. And this went even worse than the parties I've already read to you somehow. Let's check it out. I was too nervous to go out there sober, so I bought a bottle of vodka and took a few shots to garner enough courage to walk out at such an hour. I had taken one too many, for by the time I reached El Playa Street, my head was clouded with drunkenness. At the start, it benefited me greatly. I saw lots of good-looking popular kids socializing in groups all over the place, and if I wasn't drunk, it would have intimidated me too much. I was so drunk that I walked right into a wild house party that was taking place on Del Playa. They had a DJ playing annoying hip-hop music that all the young people liked these days. And there was a ping-pong table set up where lots of popular kids were playing beer pong, a crude drinking game. It's amazing that even when he's drunk, he doesn't find any of this college stuff fun. He pretty much just hates everyone there at the party and won't be happy until girls are talking to him. There were about 100 people at that party, and everyone was socializing with a group of friends except for me. I walked around in my drunken confidence for a few moments, helped myself to the beer they had, and tried to act like a normal party-goer. I soon became frustrated that no one was paying any attention to me, particularly the girls. I saw girls talking to other guys that looked like obnoxious slobs, but none of them showed any interest in me. As my frustration grew, so did my anger. I came across this Asian guy who was talking to a white girl. The sight of that filled me with rage. I always felt as if white girls thought less of me because I was half Asian. But then I see this white girl at the party talking to a full-blooded Asian. I never had that kind of attention from a white girl. And white girls are the only girls I'm attracted to, especially the blondes. How could an ugly Asian attract the attention of a white girl while a beautiful Eurasian like myself never had any attention from them? I thought with rage. I glared at them for a bit and then decided I had been insulted enough. He had been insulted enough. This is ridiculous. As usual, no one did anything to him except for not paying attention to him. Which is what you usually do with random people you don't know at parties when they don't talk to you. Personally, I've always wanted to see this next part actually play out. I bet Wasted Elliot trying to push someone around was hilarious to behold. I angrily walked toward them and bumped the Asian guy aside, trying to act cocky and arrogant to both the boy and the girl. My drunken state got the better of me and I almost fell to the floor after a few minutes of this. They said something along the lines that I was very drunk and that I needed to get some water, so I angrily left them and went out to the front yard where the main partying happened. Rage fumed inside me as I realized that I just walked away from that confrontation, so I rushed back into the house and spitefully insulted the Asian before walking outside again. I also want to know what he said to this guy. Was he just like yelling this racist shit, as everyone could see that he's Asian too? Probably. I stood awkwardly in the front yard for a bit, realizing how pathetic I looked all by myself when everyone was partying around me. To calm down, I climbed up onto a wooden ledge that bordered the street and plunged down on one of the chairs there. Isla Vista was at its wildest state at that time, and I saw lots of guys walking around with hot blonde girls on their arm. It fueled me with rage as it always had. I should be one of those guys, but no blonde girls gave me that chance. I looked down at all of them, and in my drunken carelessness extended my arm out and pretended to shoot them all, laughing giddily as I did it. Eventually some partiers climbed up onto the ledge. They were all obnoxious, rowdy boys whom I've always despised. A couple of pretty girls came up and talked to them, but not to me. They all started socializing right next to me, and none of the girls paid any attention to me. I rose from my chair and tried to act arrogant and cocky toward them, throwing insults at everyone. They only laughed at me and started insulting me back. That was the last straw. I had taken enough insults that night. You can tell this is not going anywhere good. If you're wondering why he's not talking to anyone, he was very shy and struggled with his autism. Let's listen to his friend Philip, who was interviewed after the Day of Retribution. Everyone is focusing on Elliot's lack of success with women, but they need to appreciate he was unable to communicate with anyone. I remember he once said to me, I saw this really attractive girl today, and she didn't even come up to me. She ignored me. I asked him if he tried talking to her, and he said no. Well, anyway, let's continue with him getting angry on the ledge. A dark, hate-fueled rage overcame my entire being, and I tried to push as many of them as I could from the ten-foot ledge. My main target was the girls. I wanted to punish them for talking to the obnoxious boys instead of me. It was one of the most foolish and rash things I ever did, and I almost risked everything in doing it, but I was so drunk with rage that I didn't care. I failed to push any of them from the ledge, and the boys started to push me, which resulted in me being the one to fall onto the street. 
When I landed, I felt a snap in my ankle, followed by a stinging pain. I slowly got up and found that I couldn't even walk. I had to stumble, and stumble I did. I tried to get away from there as fast as I could. Yeah, so Elliot goes after the girls physically at this point. It's only a 10 foot drop, but that could still kill someone with bad luck. Elliot was so drunk he didn't stick the landing and broke his leg in what I can only call karma. So already a pretty shameful showing at this party. He's not done yet, though. As I stumbled a few yards down Del Playa with my shattered leg, I realized that someone had stolen my Gucci sunglasses that my mother had given me. I loved those sunglasses and had to get them back. I vehemently turned around and staggered back towards the party. At that point I was so drunk that I forgot where the party was and ended up walking onto the front yard of the house next to it, demanding to know who took my sunglasses. The people in this house must have been friends with the ones I previously fought with, for they greeted me with vicious hostility. They called me names like and pussy. Typical things those types of scumbags would say. I like how Elliot is just going around being casually racist, but oh, don't call him a pussy. That would make you a scumbag. I'm also willing to bet these people had no idea who he was, and he was just being abrasive enough to piss them off. A whole group of the obnoxious brutes came up and dragged me onto their driveway, pushing and hitting me. I wanted to fight and kill them all. I managed to throw one punch toward the main attacker, but that only caused them to beat me even more. I fell to the ground where they started kicking me and punching me in the face. Eventually some other people from the street broke up the fight. I managed to have the strength to stand up and stagger away. It was the first time in my life that I had been truly beaten up physically to the point where my face was bruised up. I had suffered a lot of bullying in my life, but most of it wasn't physical. I had never been beaten and humiliated that badly. Everyone in Isla Vista saw what happened and it was truly horrific. The worst part of this whole ordeal was not getting beaten up, oh no. It was the fact that no one showed any concern. There was only one group who helped me to the end of Del Playa, but after that they abandoned me. Not one girl offered to help me as I stumbled home with a broken leg, beaten and bloody. God, there's no real excuse for any of this. It is completely beyond me how he can go from trying to injure girls by pushing them off a ledge, a pretty bold action, to wondering why no girls want to help him hobble home. I mean, would you really want to be seen with Elliot after this whole mess? If you recall, he had a tendency to take minor events very seriously, so imagine how he felt after a pretty major event like this one. If girls had been attracted to me, they would have offered to walk me to my room and take care of me. They would have even offered to sleep with me to make me feel better. But no, not one girl showed an ounce of concern for me. They didn't care. No one cared about me. I was all alone. As I got to my room, I was so traumatized that I called the only people in the world I knew, my parents and my sister. Yes, I even called my sister, someone I never got along with. I sulked for a long time and then I reached up to my neck to feel my special golden necklace and I felt nothing there. In the midst of the fight, one of those horrible punks had snatched off my special golden necklace that my grandma Ama had given me. That necklace was one of the most special items I had and now one of those evil wretched thugs will be selling it to buy drugs. I broke down in anguish and wailed in agony, crying and crying until I passed out in my bed all alone. I have gotta feel like nobody was going to sleep with anyone who had this exact night. I mean, he's all beat up and still just cannot get girls off his mind. Well, let's check out the aftermath. The physician at the hospital put me in a temporary cast and gave me crutches. On top of all other things in the world that made me feel inferior, I was now a cripple. I felt so defeated and broken. To my horror, the physician said I would have to be in crutches for the next six weeks and I might have to get surgery. The leg that broke was my left leg, so I was still able to drive. Shortly after the incident, I drove home to spend the rest of the summer recovering. It was a depressing drive. I had never felt so defeated and wronged in my life. I had actually gone out to a party in Isla Vista, hoping that I would be walking back to my room in triumph with a beautiful girl in my arm. But instead I stumbled back to my room with a shattered leg and shattered hopes. My 22nd birthday was a miserable experience. I sat around at my mother's house, staring at my broken leg, feeling so pathetic for being a cripple as well as a 22-year-old virgin. My mother bought me a new golden necklace to replace the one that was stolen from me, as she knew how heartbroken I was about losing it. 22 years old. The highly unjust experience of being beaten and humiliated in front of everyone in Isla Vista, and their subsequent lack of concern for my well-being was the last and final straw. I actually gave them all one last chance to accept me, to give me a reason not to hate them, and they devastatingly blew it back in my face. I gave the world too many chances. It was time for retribution. 
I am so confused about how he can blame anyone for how that party went but himself. Putting the Asian guy aside for now, he started shit on the ledge by insulting everyone first, and then when they insulted him back, he got pissed and started pushing people. And only then did he get pushed back. I don't condone those dudes ganging up on him, really. But what are the chances he wasn't calling them evil, low-class thugs like he keeps doing in this essay? No one likes it when some random drunk stumbles into their yard and yells at them about stealing sunglasses. It's crazy how the first time he tried to interact with girls, really the entire party was insulting them and then physically assaulting them. Make sure to let me know what you think about this party and his behavior. It was definitely alarming. But that is about all the time I have for you today. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you liked the video, please give it a like. If you have something to say, yeah, make sure to let me hear it. Elliot is a subject that pretty much everyone has something to say about. If you're new here and want more of this type of content, consider subscribing. I might be covering people more often instead of just Reddit stories. We'll have to see how it goes. Also, big thanks to my patrons who support me more directly. It's very much appreciated. Okay, so I think I can make this a three-part series when I get to it. Someone mentioned his Powerball saga, and I'd also like to cover the disaster that was him trying to get along with most of his roommates. But yeah, that's about all I have. Have a great day, everyone, and if you go to any parties, make sure you have a better time than Elliot set out to. Him talking about the annoying hip-hop music that young people like these days? Must have truly been born into the wrong time period. Hey everyone, my name's Walter, and we're back here to laugh at someone who is hopefully more shameful than any of us. What Elliot did itself isn't funny, but it's impossible not to laugh at him after reading My Twisted World. I'll link you to the first video in case you haven't seen it, but Elliot Roger is the so-called virgin killer of Isla Vista, California. He had a big elaborate plan, but he pretty much didn't follow it at all. Well, let's get started with Elliot Roger's Most Shameful Moments, Part 3. Last time we talked about the infamous college party where Elliot got drunk and made an ass of himself, and then he got beat up after he tried to push girls off a ledge. Well, this is about his college experience up until then. Let's start with him moving in and getting used to college life. Content warning, we're going to have some racism here. There was in the other videos as well, but there's more of it this time. First, he claimed to be traumatized by hearing a couple having sex upstairs the first night, but acknowledged that that was the kind of environment that he was there for. My first week turned out to be very unpleasant, leaving a horrific first impression of my new life in Santa Barbara. My two housemates were nice, but they kept inviting over this friend of theirs named Chance. He was a black boy who came over all the time, and I hated his cocksure attitude. Inevitably, a vile incident occurred between me and him. I was eating a meal in the kitchen when he came over and started bragging to my housemates about his success with girls. I couldn't stand it, so I proceeded to ask them all if they were virgins. They all looked at me weirdly and said that they had lost their virginity long ago. I felt so inferior as it reminded me of how much I have missed out on in life. Damn it, Elliot, how are you going to ask your new roommates that? I mean, even if they were virgins, they wouldn't tell you. I do like how he said they looked at him weirdly because that's exactly what I would have done. And then this black boy named Chance said that he lost his virginity when he was only 13. In addition, he said that the girl he lost his virginity to was a blonde white girl. I was so enraged that I almost splashed him with my orange juice. I indignantly told him that I did not believe him, and then I went to my room to cry. I cried and cried and cried, and then I called my mother and cried to her on the phone. How could an inferior, ugly black boy be able to get a white girl and not me? I am beautiful, and I am half-white myself. I am descended from British aristocracy. He is descended from slaves. I deserve it more. I tried not to believe his foul words, but they were already said, and it was hard to erase from my mind. If this is actually true, if this ugly black filth was able to have sex with a blonde white girl at the age of 13 while I've had to suffer virginity all my life, then this just proves how ridiculous the female gender is. They would give themselves to this filthy scum, but they reject me? The injustice! Okay, so Elliot is already off to a great start in his college experience. He just asked his roommates that they were virgins, then ran off to his room to cry to his mom all night. I don't think he was quiet when he did these kind of things either. Makes me wonder if he actually said all the racist shit to his mom, or if he just misrepresented the situation. After that, he got a couple roommates that he didn't have any problems with. It must be really weird to be one of Elliot's ex-roommates, because he ended up stabbing his roommates to death for essentially no reason. My father drove up to Santa Barbara to meet me a few days later. The two of us went to lunch at a restaurant in the Camino Real Marketplace, an area that I often frequented. 
When we sat down at our table, I saw a young couple sitting a few tables down the row. The sight of them enraged me to no end, especially because it was a dark-skinned Mexican guy dating a hot blonde white girl. I regarded it as a great insult to my dignity. How could an inferior Mexican guy be able to date a white blonde girl while I was still suffering as a lonely virgin? I was ashamed to be in such an inferior position in front of my father. When I saw the two of them kissing, I could barely contain my rage. I stood up in anger and I was about to walk up to them and pour my glass of soda all over their heads. I probably would have if father wasn't there. I was seething with envious rage and my father was there to watch it all. It was so humiliating. I wasn't the son I wanted to present to my father. I should be the one with the hot blonde girl, making my father proud. Instead, my father had to watch me suffer in a pathetic position. Life is so cruel to me. When I said my farewell to father before he drove home, I felt absolutely miserable. I then went back to my room and sulked for hours. Notice that both of these incidents talked about pouring drinks on people? Yeah, that was really on Elliot's mind. Another incident happened on the following day, near the same location. I went to the Starbucks at the Camino Real Marketplace by myself, like I usually did every morning. I ordered my coffee and sat down on one of their chairs to relax. A few moments later, when I looked up for my drink, I saw a young couple standing in line. The two of them were kissing passionately. The boy looked like an obnoxious punk. He was tall and wore baggy pants. The girl was a pretty blonde. They looked like they were in the throes of passionate sexual attraction to each other, rubbing their bodies together and tongue kissing in front of everyone. I was absolutely livid with envious hatred. When they left the store, I followed them to their car and splashed my coffee all over them. They were in the throes of passionate sexual attraction to each other. I always liked that line. Maybe Elliot's true calling was writing trashy romance novels and he just never found it. The boy yelled at me and I quickly ran away in fear. I was panicking as I got into my car and drove off, shaking with rage-fueled excitement. I drove all the way to the Vons at the Fairway Plaza and spent three hours in my car trying to contain my tumultuous emotions. I had never struck back at my enemies before, and I felt a small sense of spiteful gratification for doing so. I hated them so much. Even though I splashed them with my coffee, he was still the winner. He was going home to have passionate, heavenly sex with his beautiful girlfriend, and I was going home to my lonely room to sleep alone in my lonely bed. I had never felt so miserable and mistreated in my life. I cursed the world for condemning me to such suffering. At this point, Elliot was escalating. He was about to become 20 and was desperate to lose his virginity before then. On one of my last days as a teenager, I was sitting at my usual place at the food court outside Domino's. I saw a sight that shattered my heart to pieces. A tall, blonde, jock-type guy walked into one of the restaurants and at his side was one of the sexiest girls I had ever seen. She too was tall and blonde. They were both taller than me and they kissed each other passionately. They made me feel so inferior and worthless and small. I glared at them with intense hatred as I sat by myself in my lonely misery. I could never have a girl like that. The sight was burned into my memory and it caused a scar that will haunt me forever. When they walked away I followed them in my car for a few minutes, and when they entered a less inhabited area I opened my window and splashed my iced tea all over them. It was all I could do at the time, but at least it was something. At least I made some effort to fight back against the injustice. I felt sick with hatred that night. The hatred boiled inside me with burning vitriol. At this point, Elliot would get yet another set of roommates, and let's hope things went better for him this time. August 5th came quickly, and I prepared myself to be in a pleasant mood to meet them. Their names were Ryan and Angel, and to my dismay, they were of Hispanic race. In addition, the two of them were already friends with each other, which meant that they could possibly gang up against me if any conflicts were to arise. They also seemed like rowdy, low-class types. My first impression of them soured me, but I tried to be pleasant and not show it. The two of them acted cordial to me on the first day, but after observing them for a bit, I had a bad feeling that they would be trouble to live with. And they were to be my housemates for a whole year. When I was alone in my room, I panicked to myself at how dire of a situation this was. This was extremely disappointing. I was hoping I would get decent, mature, clean-cut housemates. Instead, I got low-class scum. Yeah, you know, I don't think this was ever going to work out. He was so ready to hate anyone he had to live with. On the second day, they started inviting their equally rowdy friends into my apartment, and we exchanged more small talk. To my indignant surprise, they asked me the question I always dreaded answering. Are you a virgin? I admitted that I was a virgin. I always admitted the truth about this. It was my life struggle, and I couldn't lie about such a thing. They then had the audacity to tell me that they lost their virginity long ago, bragging about all the girls they had slept with. I particularly hated Angel because of his ugly pig face. 
How could such an ugly animal have had sexual experiences with girls, and yet I haven't? What was wrong with this world? I got so angry that I went to my room and punched the wall. They heard me and started laughing. It was almost a repeat of what I experienced with that black boy named Chance in the old apartment, except this time it was worse because these were my housemates for the year. Man, I can understand having problems with your roommates, but I can't really imagine not lasting a single day without messing things up this badly. I guess that's what happens when you're going to be racist. It's still cringy to ask your roommates if they're virgins, but this is Elliot Roger we're talking about, so he probably said something weird that made it really obvious. On the day after, I almost got into a physical fight with Angel. The ugly pig kept acting as if girls thought he was more attractive than me. Ha! Huh. I am a beautiful, magnificent gentleman, and he is a low-class, pig-faced thug. I had enough of his cocksure attitude, and I started to call him exactly what he was. I tried to insult him as much as I could, telling him how superior I am to him and saying he was low class. He tried to attack me, but Ryan, being the more mellow of the two, held him back. A pity. I was itching for a chance to hurt that obnoxious little animal. Though I suppose it was for the best. My life was too important to risk doing anything rash. His life was too important to risk doing anything rash. What a line. This was before he came up with the Day of Retribution, obviously, but still. So he called his mom crying and got her to pay a hundred dollars more for a bigger room, but he had to sit through a month of his current living situation. I don't think I've ever called anyone low class in my life, and Elliot has done it so many times now in this writing. I would only stay in Santa Barbara during the weekdays, but on those weekdays, Angel and Ryan went out of their way to make my life a living hell. Every time they went out, they kept yelling to me how they're going to sleep with hot girls that night. I knew they were just lying to make me jealous. They always made fun of me for being a virgin. At night, they frequently made noise to wake me up. I was literally being bullied, and it was truly horrific. I wanted to kill them both, but of course I was smart enough to not go through with that desire. All I could do was remember every single insult so I can get revenge in a more efficient way in the future. That is who I am. I don't act stupidly or rashly. I remember every insult, and I wait until the time is right to strike. When that time comes, I will crush all of my enemies in the most devastating and catastrophic way possible, and the results will be beautiful. You know, I'm guessing this might partially explain why he stabbed his roommates so many times when he did it. But of course, they were different people. Let's cover one more incident that occurred on one of his weekend visits home. It's crazy how he went to so much effort to go to this college and now he was spending as little time there as possible. This time, we chose to eat at Panda Express. While we were eating, some high school kids walked in. James saw them first, and right when he saw them, he said the words, We're fucked. James knew I would have trouble with them. They were popular boys who had a flock of pretty girls with them. One of them sat down with two of the girls, putting his leg up on another chair with a cocky smirk on his face. I was livid with rage and I wanted to pour my drink all over his head. James knew exactly what I was planning to do. We had been through similar incidents before. He made a lot of effort to try to dissuade me from acting on my anger, pointing out that there was a security guard nearby. I did the only thing I could do. I packed up my dinner and left the restaurant, fleeing in defeat and shame. James soon followed, and we decided to finish our meal at his house. This was his oldest friend James, and this incident would lead to their friendship finally ending. Okay, let's read a few online posts from Elliot, and then I'm going to call it a day. We're not done with the series yet, though. Seriously, today at my college I saw this short, ugly Indian guy driving a Honda Civic, and he had a hot blonde girl in his passenger seat. What on earth is up with that? I would climb Mount Everest ten times just to have a girl like that with me. I drive a BMW coupe and I've struggled all my life to get a girlfriend. What's wrong with this world? Does anyone else get disturbed and offended when you see sights like this? Someone makes sense of this ridiculousness. You know, I respect a Honda Civic that someone paid for more than a BMW their rich parents gave them. I'm not a blonde college girl or anything, but some of them might feel that way too. One more. And even if you hate bullying, this post is going to make you want to shove this kid into a locker. I laugh at those two losers in this thread who called me an average-looking manlet. It's so ridiculous that I'm laughing instead of getting angry. I am a drop-dead gorgeous, fabulous, stylish, exotic gem among thousands of rocks. I'm one of a kind, completely the opposite of average. You're just jealous because I'm better looking than you, and you know it. He sounds so full of himself, but we know from reading his manifesto that he was actually pretty much the most insecure person in the world. Anyway, that's about all the time I have for you today. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you like the video, please give it a like. If you have something to say about The Supreme Gentleman or my video, make sure you let me hear it in the comments. If you're new here and want more about Elliot and Lucas and random nice guys on the internet, consider subscribing for more of the same. 
And also a big thanks to my awesome patrons who help me support myself while I make these videos. I'll be shouting them out soon here. Have a great night, everyone, and drink your coffee. Don't pour it on people. Hey everyone, this is Walter, and we're back here to talk about the Supreme Gentleman once again. Elliot Roger is known as the Virgin Killer, and has been called the patron saint of incels by many. He outlined many cringy events in his life in his so-called manifesto, My Twisted World. So let's get back to discussing them with Elliot Roger's Most Shameful Moments, Part 4. Last time, we covered his problems with roommates in Isla Vista. When we left off, his friend James had to stop him from dumping his drink on some teenagers he was jealous of. A dark and ominous aura clouded over our friendship that day. When the two of us got back to James's house, I was still seething with rage. I didn't understand why James wasn't angry like me. The sight that we just witnessed was horrible to watch. To see another male be successful with females is torture for males like us who have no success with females. I was so angry that I told James of all of the acts of revenge I wanted to exact on those popular boys. I told him my desire to flay them alive, to strip the skin off their flesh, and make them scream in agony as punishment for living a better life than me. James became deeply disturbed by my anger. I wished that he wasn't disturbed. I wished he could be a friend that felt the same way about the world that I did. But he wasn't that kind of person. He was a weakling. Once I had calmed down, the two of us had a long conversation in his room, and I ended up crying in front of him as I explained how hopeless I felt about life. Soon after that, I left his house, never to return there again. He will never invite me over after that incident, and our friendship will slowly fade to dust. Elliot's reasoning once again makes no sense. He's calling other people weak when he's the one who can't even be in a class with a couple in it. Check this out. After a couple of days, I decided to drop my history class. I couldn't stand watching those obnoxious popular boys talk to all the pretty girls in the class. The girls actually liked them. I should be the one they pay attention to, but they treated me like I was invisible. I didn't want to torture myself any longer. I felt a sense of guilt as I did it because I made a bid to make the best of my time in Santa Barbara. Once the class was dropped, I felt a sense of relief. I was still enrolled in the geography class, and it was only the summer session. I had plenty of time to make up for it. I do like how Elliot's living off his parents' money here and taking two classes at a time. I remember taking like five when I went to school, but... Yeah, this is far from the first time he's dropped classes for this kind of reason. He did it multiple times at his community college, too. During the last few days that I had to endure living with those barbaric housemates, I often walked out to Isla Vista, hoping that I could meet a girl and take her home with me. I wanted to prove to them all that girls liked me, to see the look on their faces when they see a girl by my side. But of course I had nothing to prove because girls didn't like me. Every time I tried to go out and meet a girl, I ended up walking home alone in anger. On one of these nights, I crossed paths with a boy who was walking with two pretty girls. I got so envious that I cursed at them, and then I followed them for a few minutes. They just laughed at me, and one of the girls kissed the boy on the lips. I'm assuming she was his girlfriend. That was one of the worst experiences of torture from girls that I've had to endure, and it will be a scar in my memory forever, to remind me that girls think I'm unworthy compared to other boys. I ran home with tears pouring down my cheeks, hoping that my horrible housemates wouldn't be there to witness my shame. It's like he just tries to end every situation as pathetically as possible. Not only do most men not get mad about things like this, they probably don't even notice it. I'm sure I wouldn't. My usual day went as follows. I woke up alone in my bed with no girl beside me and did a few minutes of exercise before I showered and got ready for college. I then drove to Starbucks to have my morning latte and felt envious whenever I saw a young couple there. I would then attend my two classes where no one said a word to me, having to endure the torment of watching other guys talk to the girls I liked. And then I would go home, open the door to my lonely room and feel absolutely miserable. The loneliness was suffocating. I could barely breathe. If only one pretty girl had at least given me a chance and tried to get to know me, everything would have turned out differently, but girls continued to treat me with disdain. How exactly is not talking to someone you don't know treating them with disdain? Elliot had his lonely room for two weeks before getting his next roommate, a short chubby student about a year older than him named Spencer Horowitz. This did go a lot better than his last roommate situation, admittedly. In addition, I was a bit shocked when Spencer told me that he used to have a girlfriend. It was a casual comment that came out of a conversation we had. I didn't understand how a chubby and unattractive guy like Spencer would have been able to get a girlfriend while I've never had the chance to. The guy was three inches shorter than me, and even I am considered short for my age. Your age? He was an adult. 
I could not fathom how such a thing was possible, and I concluded to myself that this former girlfriend of his that he mentioned must have been just as unattractive as he was. There was no need for me to be jealous. It is completely impossible to not piss this kid off. After a few weeks of living with him, I realized that I had a psychological problem with his presence in my apartment. Even though there was no trouble between us, I hated having someone constantly in my vicinity to judge how pathetic my life was. I could hide the details of my lonely celibate life from the rest of the world, but I could not hide it from Spencer. The fact that I never had any girls over to my room was clear enough that I was an undesirable outcast, and I hated it when people knew this about me and judged me for it. Spencer was there to witness it all, and I would eventually come to hate him just because of that. Around this time, Elliot actually met some friends and was hanging out with them. But he stopped when he decided they weren't popular and couldn't help him get a girl. However, another vile incident would occur with his new roommate. So far, Spencer and I had gotten along quite well despite the fact that we never talked much. An incident happened at the end of January that changed all of this. I one day discovered that Spencer had a girl in his room. I couldn't believe it. The short, chubby guy was able to get a girl into his room before I did. I was so shocked and outraged that I waited outside his room until the girl left so I could get a glimpse of how she looked. To my relief, she wasn't that attractive. What made me even more angry is that Spencer gave me a smug look when I saw the girl, even though she was ugly. He had the nerve to feel like he was better than me, just because he managed to get a girl over to the apartment before I did. I confronted him in the kitchen on that same night, telling him that he is foolish to feel proud about having an ugly whore in his room. This made him angry and offended, which is what I wanted. I wanted to offend him as punishment for his insolence. After that incident, the two of us became more and more hostile towards each other. Well, you don't say. He really does talk like a shitty anime villain. Just listen to this whole next sequence. It was a bright sunny day as I ascended the familiar steps up to the beautiful college campus of SBCC. I immediately went to the restroom to look at myself in the mirror a few times, just so that I can feel more assured of myself. Yes, I thought, I am the image of beauty and supremacy. I kept saying it over and over again, as if it was a mantra. When I crossed the renowned bridge that connected the two halves of the campus, I felt as if everyone was admiring me. As I passed by groups of girls, I pretended to imagine that they secretly adored and wanted me. After all, that was how it was meant to be. The more I walked around the campus, the more I tried to convince myself that that was the case. My first class was sociology, and I waited until everyone was seated before I walked in. I came in through the front entrance so that everyone could look at my fabulous self. To my utter dismay, I saw that no one turned their head to look at me at all. No girl tilted a head or lifted a pretty little eyebrow at my approach. After all that effort, I was still being treated like I was invisible. Yeah, this isn't a red carpet event. Nobody's going to be wowed that you walked in wearing $500 sunglasses or whatever. And this incident also happened the first week of the semester. More dumping drinks on people. As I made my way back from school one day during the first week, I was stopped at a stoplight in Isla Vista when I saw two hot blonde girls waiting at the bus stop. I was dressed in one of my nice shirts, so I looked at them and smiled. They looked at me, but they didn't even deign to smile back. They just looked away as if I was a fool. As I drove away, I became very infuriated. It was such an insult. This was the way all girls treated me, and I was sick and tired of it. In a rage, I made a U-turn, pulled up to their bus stop, and splashed my Starbucks latte all over them. I felt a feeling of satisfaction as I saw it stain their jeans. I then quickly speeded away before they could catch my license plate number. How dare those girls snub me in such a fashion? How dare they insult me so? I raged to myself repeatedly. They deserved the punishment I gave them. It was such a pity that my latte wasn't hot enough to burn them. Those girls deserve to be dumped in boiling water for the crime of not giving me the attention and adoration I so rightfully deserve. I soon found out the name of the beautiful girl in my math class. Her name was Brittany. Being the obsessed stalker that I was, I looked her up on Facebook, and what I found shattered my already wounded heart to pieces. She had a boyfriend. Not only that, but her boyfriend was the type of boy I have always hated and despised. A tall, muscular surfer jock with a buzz cut. As I looked at all the pictures of the two of them together, I shivered with pure hatred. I could physically feel the hatred burn through my entire body. I wanted to kill both of them, and I was capable of doing it. Brittany should have been mine, and if I can't have her, no one should. I fantasized about capturing the two of them and stripping the skin off her boyfriend's flesh while making her watch. Why must my life be so full of torment and hatred? I questioned the universe with turmoil roiling inside me. I screamed and cried with anguish that day. My housemate Spencer heard it all, but I didn't care. 
Must have really been a blast to have Elliot as a roommate. So he dropped all of his classes after finding out this girl had a boyfriend. He had decided college wasn't worth it because his only chance to get what he wanted was to become extremely wealthy. This was also when he decided to enact a day of retribution if he wasn't able to become rich. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to live. Thinking about the day of retribution made me feel trapped. I wanted a way out. After some deep contemplation, I had the revelation that the day of retribution wasn't the only way I could make up for all the suffering I've had to experience. If I could somehow become a multi-millionaire at a young age, then my lifestyle would instantly become better than most people my age. I would be able to get revenge on my enemies just by living above them and lording over them. That was a form of happy, peaceful revenge, and it became my only hope. Once again, I started to desperately ponder over ways that I could become extremely wealthy at a young age. It was my only way out. So with the idea of getting rich, he set his sights on the lottery, a notoriously terrible way to make money. Let's read a few of his online quotes and then we're going to call it a day. Shoes won't help you get white girls. White girls are disgusted by you, silly little Asian. Never insult the style of Elliot Roger. I'm the most stylish person in the world. Just look at my profile pic. That's just one of my fabulous outfits. The sweater I'm wearing in the picture is $500 from Neiman Marcus. And one more. If we can't solve our problems, we must destroy our problems. One day incels will realize their true strength in numbers and will overthrow this oppressive feminist system. Start envisioning a world where women fear you. Yeah, he sounds like a pretty reasonable guy. Anyway, that's about all the time I have for you today. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you liked the video, please give it a like. If you have something to say about Elliot, or me, or you, make sure you let me hear it in the comments. I do read them for the first day or so. If you're new here and want more, consider subscribing for more of the same kind of content. And now it's time to shout out my awesome patrons who help fund my lifestyle, whatever that is. It might not be as glamorous as Elliot's. Thanks so much, though. Jimmo, Alatuna Dan, Enui Blue, Levon, Maxo11x, Chris Sturman, MDB3000, Amelia Bunny, Amanda Gillies, Big Mike Shirley, Cacti Lady Wither, Cho, Daniel Delapena, Deborah Douglas, Dr. A, Vin Yi, Horatio T, Justin Godsey, Kitty Sparkles, Clipper, Barbie, Ouroboros, Rob Sop, Sammy, Sandyman, Spoonie the Rogue, V stands for, William Ash, Jacob K, Camper Supreme, Megan Breeze, Psychic Kumquat, Alex Anakin, Alan Fang, Knit One Code 2, Lil Spoon, Ms. Mayhem, Staples, aka Jerry Yeet, Ben Pot, Francois Tremblay, Myopa Game, Nick Lucarelli, and Petulant Panda. Thanks again. Have a great day, everyone, and make sure you don't have a girl over in your room before Elliot does. He hates that shit. Hey, everyone. This is Walter, and I'm back here with the Supreme Gentleman once again. This is part five, I believe. The others aren't strictly necessary to enjoy this one, but you might want to check them out if you haven't. This might be the last episode. We're running out of noteworthy, shameful moments. I have to thank Elliot for recording all these details in my twisted world, his so-called manifesto. Otherwise, we wouldn't know most of it. For the uninitiated, Elliot Roger is the virgin killer of Isla Vista, California. A member of the early incel community, he embarked on a day of retribution that's probably worth its own video. So anyway, let's get started with Elliot Rogers' most shameful moments. At the time where we're starting, Elliot's a 20-year-old college student and he just went to a red carpet event where he was disdainful of the normal people and incredibly jealous of the rich people. So he now decided that the only way to get his dream of a beautiful wife and kids was to get filthy rich, like hundreds of millions of dollars. He considered writing a fantasy epic to be made into a movie, but realized that would take too much time and effort, and so would all of his other ideas. His solution? After a lot of deep thinking, I couldn't come up with anything. Was I doomed to fail at everything? I began to feel hopeless, until I saw the current jackpot for the Mega Millions Lottery. It was rising very high in the month of March. I had saved up a lot of money at the time, so I had enough to spare on lottery tickets so long as I didn't go under $5,000, which I wanted to keep as my minimum amount of savings just in case of an emergency, or in case I would have to carry out the Day of Retribution. As it so happened, I had well over $6,000 saved up at the time from all of the allowance, Christmas money, and birthday money that my parents and grandmothers had been sending me. Yeah, Elliot in his poor college phase had more money in the bank than I do right now. That's great. He's counting on winning the lottery. Solid plan. For the first time since moving to Santa Barbara, I began to take a serious interest in playing the lottery again. 
I believed that it was destiny for me to win the Mega Millions lottery, particularly this very jackpot. People win the lottery every single month, so why not me? I was meant to live a life of significance and extravagance. For the first few drawings I played, I spent $50 to $100 on tickets, but to my profound frustration, I still didn't win, and the jackpot kept rising. This only increased my enthusiasm. I started to picture a whole new perfect life for myself after I won. I imagined buying a beautiful opulent mansion with an extravagant view and acquiring a collection of supercars which I would use specifically to attract beautiful girls into my life. I planned to go back to college once I had bolstered myself with all this wealth and lured myself over the other students there, finally fulfilling my dream of being the coolest and most popular kid at school. As I sat meditating in my room, I imagined the ecstasy I would feel as scores of beautiful girls look at me with admiration as I drive up to college in a Lamborghini. Such an experience would make up for everything. I had to win this jackpot. I don't know why he's calling himself a kid. I'd probably call a 20-year-old a kid now, but I wouldn't have said it when I was 20. I mean, I kind of question, if nobody was impressed by his BMW, why does he think it'll be any different with a Lamborghini? As the jackpot reached over $200 million, I spent more of my saved money on lottery tickets, but I still didn't win. I knew that the more I spent on tickets, the higher chance I had of winning. I was so desperate to live a satisfying life that I spent $400 on tickets when the jackpot hit $290 million. When I failed to win that, I spent $500 on tickets when it reached $363 million, and I still didn't win it on that one. And then the jackpot reached a number that I never imagined it would. $656 million. I was astounded and filled with a feverish enthusiasm of hope and desire. This was the highest lottery jackpot in history. I knew I was always destined for great things. This must be it. I was destined to be the winner of the highest lottery jackpot in existence. I knew right then and there that this jackpot was meant for me. Who else deserves such a victory? I had been through so much rejection, suffering, and injustice in my life, and this was to be my salvation. I can't exactly speak on his suffering, but has he really been through a lot of rejection or injustice? He's having his college tuition and a room paid for right now. I've got to feel like Elliot could only do these things because nobody was around to tell him not to. Anyone would tell you not to spend large amounts of money trying to win the lottery. But Elliot's last friendship, the one to James Ellis, was pretty dead at this point. We'll get to that in a second. With my whole body filled with feverish hope, I spent $700 on lottery tickets for this drawing. As I spent this money, I imagined all the amazing sex I would have with a beautiful model girlfriend I would have once I become a man of wealth. After the ultimate and fateful drawing, I waited three days to check the result. I was too anxious about what I will see. The result would determine the fate of my whole life. For those three days, I meditated alone in my room, trying to convince myself that I was the winner. I held all of the tickets in my hand, excitedly pondering over which one was the true winning ticket. There were many times during this period where I was about to check the result, but cancelled the webpage in the last second out of fear of what I might see. The prospect of finding out that I lost was devastating. On the fourth day, I decided to just go through with it. The result was already decided, and the amount of time it took for me to check it wouldn't change anything. I had to see the truth. My heart was beating rapidly as I loaded up the webpage to the Mega Millions website. What I saw crushed all my hope completely. My whole body shivered with horrific agony. I didn't win. Three people won that jackpot, and it was split between them. But none of those three people were me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was certain I would be the winner. It was destiny. Fate. But no, the world continued to give me no justice or salvation whatsoever. I know Elliot's parents didn't do enough, but I'm not exactly sure what I'd do if I had a son and he fell into a horrible depression because he didn't win the lottery. It only makes as much sense as it does because we're reading his thoughts. I sank into one of the worst depressions of my life. It was spring break and while all other young boys my age were going off to vacation with their attractive friends, I was feeling miserable and alone in my room because I failed to win the lottery jackpot that would enable me to rise above them all. I was so depressed that even when my mother came up to Santa Barbara with my sister and her friends for a short day trip, I refused to see them. Shortly after this, his only remaining friend would finally cut ties with him. This was over the incident where he almost went and poured a drink over someone's head while eating with James. I covered it in one of the parts of this series. My deep depression lasted well into the summer. My life stayed stagnant and miserable, and my hatred towards everyone, especially women, for depriving me of a happy life, only grew stronger. I questioned myself over and over about what was going to happen to me now. 
I didn't want it to resort to having to exact ultimate vengeance. I didn't want to die. I wanted something to live for. There had to be a way for me to become wealthy. I continued to see it as the only way I would ever have a beautiful girlfriend and lose my virginity. My ultimate dream was to experience the pleasures of love and sex with girls once I become rich enough to be worthy of them, and then I would settle down with a beautiful girlfriend and have beautiful children with her, whom I would raise up to live a much better life than the one I've had to suffer through. That would be the most satisfying vengeance against all those young people who thought they were better than me. If I could show them that I lived such a life, my purpose on this world would be complete. To see the look on all their faces once I've risen above them, I couldn't imagine anything sweeter. At this point, Elliot came across a book called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind, which taught him about the Law of Attraction. Supposedly, this meant that he could make goals happen by visualizing them. Elliot gained some hope back because of this concept and was able to go out to eat at a Japanese restaurant with his mom and sister, where he said the bill reached well over $200. Man, I'm always uncomfortable ordering expensive stuff when someone else is paying. Elliot just revels in it at the same time as he talks about the horrific life he's been forced to endure. It's so bizarre. Before I knew it, my lease at my current room ended, and on September 5th, I transferred to the new room. Spencer and I didn't deign to say goodbye to each other. We despised each other that much. I knew I would see him again, when I track him down to show off my wealth that I firmly believed I would attain. Elliot, nobody's going to be impressed by your wealth if you win the lottery. They'll be like, uh, good for you. On September 11th, the drawing for a jackpot worth $120 million commenced. I bought a $5 ticket and proclaimed that this had to be mine. When I saw that the winner was from California, my heart beat like a drum. This was it. Fate was being decided right at that moment. Elliot probably thought this was the worst thing to ever happen on 9-11. I didn't win. I looked at my ticket over and over again, and then at the winning numbers. No match. It was just like what happened in March, except this was worse because I had built up anticipation for the entire summer. The winner was some guy from Riverside. He took my money. What a waste. What an injustice. I was so certain that the universe would finally grant me salvation after a life of torture and suffering. I then looked at my small, cramped room and realized my lonely, depressing life of virginity will continue on mercilessly. That night, I threw a wild tantrum, screaming and crying for hours on end. I had the whole apartment to myself, so there was no one there to hear me. I raged at the entire world, thrashing at my bed with my wooden practice sword and slashing at the air with my pocket knife. I even downed an entire bottle of wine and got so drunk that I spilled my wine all over my laptop, permanently destroying it. I soaked my pillow with tears as I drifted off to sleep in my lonely bed. Well, there we go. There hadn't been enough tantrums yet in this episode, but that's one of his best. On the next morning, I felt so drained and depressed. I then realized that I destroyed my laptop, so I called my mother, begging her to buy me a new one. I made up the story that the laptop randomly died, and I had no control over it. After some persuading, I managed to make her agree to buy me a new one. I quickly drove to Best Buy to look for a new laptop, and decided to choose a newer, updated version of the Asus laptop I had previously. As it turned out, the Best Buy in Santa Barbara didn't have one in stock, so I had to drive all the way to Oxnard to pick one up. I paid the $1,500 for it, with the assurance that my mother will drive up to bring me a reimbursement in a few days. Elliot was not actually rich like people seem to say, but his mom buying him a $1,500 laptop as a replacement in college is a stark contrast from my own experience. That's how much I spent on my work laptop, which I've been careful not to spill any wine on, believe it or not. I didn't even bother to register for college classes that semester. There was no point. I believed that I would either fulfill my dream of becoming wealthy at a young age in order to be worthy enough to attract beautiful women, or exact my revenge upon the world and die in the process to escape punishment. There was no other path for me. Of course, I registered for some classes, but only to keep up the pretense to my parents that I was still attending college. If they somehow found out that I had dropped my classes right after registering for them, they would have stopped all their support for me, and my life would have to end right then and there. Thankfully, I was a good liar. Elliot, for whatever reason, wouldn't play the lottery unless it was over $100 million. Despite fawning over his father being somewhat wealthy his whole life, Elliot couldn't settle for just being a millionaire. He had to be very rich. But I think he just had no idea what money was worth, between this and everything else. As the phrase that I had coined goes, if I cannot join them, I will rise above them. And if I cannot rise above them, I will destroy them. I've been trying to join and be accepted among the beautiful popular people all my life, but it was to no avail. 
They have always treated me like scum. The girls have always deemed me unworthy of their love and sex. I tried to overthrow them by gaining wealth at a young age, from trying to come up with invention ideas, to contemplating writing an epic story, and finally to trying to win the lottery. At this point, the prospect of overthrowing them seemed hopeless. The final solution to triumph over my enemies was to destroy them, to carry out my day of retribution, to exact my ultimate and devastating vengeance against all the popular young people who never accepted me, and against all women for rejecting me and starving me of love and sex. So then at this point, Elliot bought a gun, of course. But the story about the lottery is longer than I remember, so we're gonna have to return. This was the part about Mega Millions, but he gives it another few chances with a Powerball after this. Elliot was rather convinced that the universe owed him this luck after reading that book, but he seemed to believe it even before that. Well, that is about all the time I have for you today. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you liked the video, please give it a like. If you have something to say, make sure you let me hear it in the comments. I'll be reading those, at least while the video's new. If you're new here, consider subscribing for more of the same and whatever else I feel like talking about. Now it's time to shout out my awesome patrons who help support me more directly over on Patreon. It's been a big help, you know, through the pandemic and all that crap. Thanks so much. Jimmo, NOE Blue, Levon, Maxo11x, Chris Sturman, MDB3000, Totally Not a Femboy, Bumbus McDunga, Clipper, Amanda Gillies, Bethy Williams, Big Mike Shirley, Cacti Lady Wither, Cho, Daniel De La Pena, Don Smith, Dr. A, Horatio T, Leanne Summers, Ouroboros, Rob Sop, Sammy, Sandyman, Spoonie the Rogue, V stands for, Wernology, William Ash, Psychic Kumquat, Alex Anakin, Alan Fang, Knit One Code 2, Lil Spoon, Ms. Mayhem, Francois Tremblay, Nick Lucarelli, and Petulant Panda. Thanks once again. The Patreon link's in the description. It does turn out that I can actually stream again, so I might be doing more of that in the near future. I don't monetize my streams, so I don't have to worry about it as much. Anyway, I'll be back with some more stories soon, and the conclusion to Elliot Rogers' lottery addiction, at some point in the next few weeks. Have a great day, everyone, and try not to destroy your expensive objects when you're throwing a tantrum. Hey, everyone. My name's Walter, and I'm back here to bring you more of Elliot Rogers' constant shame. Elliot is the man who would come to be known as the virgin killer of Isla Vista, and incels would eventually crown him their patron saint along with St. Black Ops 2 Cell. I haven't followed the incels in years, so they might not even say this stuff anymore, to be fair. I think I will be making a Day of Retribution video, because he really didn't do a great job, even at that. But today is the conclusion of his lottery woes, when he finds out about Powerball. Let's just get started with Elliot Rogers' Most Shameful Moments, Part 6. I'll link to Part 5 if you haven't seen it. This is a continuation. I continued to visit the website of the Mega Millions Lottery, I still clung to the hope that it may rise above a hundred million dollars again, and I would be the winner. So far I saw that as my only way out of my horrible situation. My situation was indeed horrible. I couldn't leave the house without seeing a young couple walking around somewhere. Everywhere I went, I was all by myself, while other young people had friends and girlfriends. I was ashamed to show myself to the world, even though I wore expensive designer clothes. What was the point if girls still weren't attracted to me? No one respects a man who is unable to get a woman. A man wearing shorts and a t-shirt would be seen as superior to me if he walks into a store with a beautiful girl on his arm and I walk in all alone. A man having a beautiful girl by his side shows the world he is worth something, because obviously that beautiful girl sees some sort of worth in him. If a man is all alone, people get the impression that girls are repulsed by him, and therefore he is a worthless loser. Yeah, so Elliot thought everyone else thought just like him. The people were constantly judging everyone based on how much money they seemed to have, and especially whether they had an attractive girlfriend. So every time he ever went somewhere alone, or even with male friends, he felt like a fucking loser. This kid was really torturing himself. Not like anyone was going to be that impressed if he found a girlfriend. Earlier in that day as I drove through Isla Vista, I saw this one particular young couple that stood out from the rest only because the girl looked absolutely perfect. She was tall, blonde, and sexy. She would have towered over me in height, and her boyfriend of course towered over her. They were both wearing beach gear, and the girl was in her bikini, showing off to everyone her sensual, erection-causing body. Her blonde hair was wet from swimming in the ocean, and it only made her look more arousing. The two of them were holding hands, and it was clear that they were in love. I saw the boyfriend place his hand on the girl's ass, and when he did this, the girl looked at him and smiled with delight. That guy was in heaven. I can only imagine how amazing it must be to have sex with a girl like that. 
I had to witness everything I wanted but could not have. It made me feel dizzy with anguish. Her sensual erection-causing body. That's a good line. I immediately thought about that couple and how impossible it was for me to have the same experience as that guy. Impossible as I was at that point. But it would be possible for me to get a tall, blonde, sexy girlfriend if I was a multimillionaire. Oh yes, it would be very possible. Becoming a multimillionaire is the only way I could have such an experience, and winning the lottery was the only way I could become a multimillionaire at my age. As I stared at the Powerball jackpot that was over $500 million, I knew that I had to win it. It was midnight when I had this revelation, and the drawing was on the following day. The only way I could get a ticket before the drawing was if I left for Arizona right then and there, and so that is exactly what I did. I quickly looked up the best route on Google Maps, packed some food into my backpack, and took off. Oh yeah, it's completely impossible to be a multimillionaire at the age of 22. Just ask Jake Paul. I know there weren't quite the same options to make money online in 2014, but his defeatist attitude really gets in his way a lot. And his day of retribution would obviously suffer from it too. Anyway, Elliot decided to drive to Arizona to play Powerball. He did this in one night with some difficulty. But he waited three days to check it once again. There was an Arizona winner, and I had bought my ticket in Arizona. After that long emotional journey, driving toward the sunrise in the middle of the desert, fighting off sleep just to get there in time, visualizing my whole future before me, with a beautiful blonde girlfriend and the children I would have with her. After all that, who else could the winner be but me? It was meant for me. It was fate. Destiny. I took out my tickets, of which I had purchased 50, and sifted through them to find the one that matched the winning numbers. I felt dizzy and ecstatic as I did it, feeling so certain that my victory will be confirmed. When I reached the end of my stack of tickets, I didn't find that any matched. For the first few moments, I couldn't even believe what was happening. I looked through all of my tickets, again and again and again, and still nothing. I didn't win. People often say that Elliot's a good writer, but I'm not really sure I agree in general. That being said, the parts about the lottery are probably the best written parts in my twisted world, despite being a bit repetitive. When I got to the park, I sat in my car for hours, crying and crying and crying. I wailed with agony. My tears streamed down my face and stained my collar. I couldn't take it anymore. Feeling the need to talk to someone, I called the only people I had in my life. My parents. I called them both, first my mother and then my father, and I told them both how much I was suffering from my loneliness, and my utter realization that I had no hope of ever having a happy life. I told them that they must be ashamed of me, that I was a 21-year-old virgin who was unable to get a girlfriend or making any friends whatsoever. I was not the son any parent would want. My tantrum to my parents on the phone deeply disturbed them, and they arranged for me to see my psychiatrist, Dr. Charles Sophie, when I returned home for the winter break. I'm sure his parents are acutely aware now that this was more of a cry for help than they were even aware of. Elliot started to form his specific plans about the Day of Retribution at this point. We'll be covering all that in another video, I think. I don't think I've talked about it specifically since my 100 subscriber special on my first channel like four years ago. Crazy to think about. I remained in my hometown for a couple of weeks, and then I went back to Santa Barbara, the place of beauty and romance that I've had to suffer in lonely hell. I only signed up for online classes for the spring semester, but that was only to placate my parents. I didn't see the point in even bothering with college anymore. Having to walk through SBCC with all those beautiful girls strutting around in their revealing shorts, showing off their sexy legs, it is torture, because I know that they would all reject me. Well, women certainly aren't attracted to that kind of attitude. It's crazy, he had to go through so much trouble to go to this specific school that he saw in a movie because everyone would be hooking up, but now it's become a nightmare to him. Who could have seen that coming? At one point, I looked out my window and saw couples strolling around the street on their way to some party. They probably slept with each other that night. The sight made me feel so inferior, like a little mouse. I felt like I was at the bottom of the food chain. I couldn't fathom how I had to endure such a painful life. On that same night, I looked at the Powerball again and saw that the jackpot had risen to over $100 million. This prompted me to drive to Arizona again in another desperate attempt to become instantly wealthy so that I could attract beautiful girls and live the life I want. After all of the rejection and mistreatment I've experienced at the hands of women, I knew that becoming wealthy was the only way I could become worthy of them. And so my obsession with becoming wealthy at a young age came back in full force for the first few months of 2013. This guy just won't stop talking about how amazing and fabulous and supreme he is in his videos and posts, but in his writing you can see that he considered himself unworthy of women unless he had money. It's kind of a sad thing to think, but it fits with the incel label. 
By the month of April, I had driven to Arizona three more times, making a total of four trips to Arizona in my lifetime, just to buy lottery tickets out of intense desperation, believing it to be my only hope of attaining the life I desire, the life I know I'm worthy of. I kept dreaming of the life I would have once I won, the beautiful blonde girlfriend, the luxurious mansion with a magnificent view, all of the exotic cars I would drive to impress girls. It gave me hope. It gave me something to live for. That hope was shattered after each attempt. None of the tickets I bought on these trips fulfilled my dreams. The reason I kept going, even after I didn't win, was because I truly believed I was supposed to win. I wanted to believe it, because I wanted something to live for. I needed to have hope. I knew that if I lost all of my hope, I would have nothing to live for but revenge. Any chance of having a happy life would be doomed. The only way he can live a happy life is if he wins the jackpot in the lottery. How can someone think that's a reasonable way of thinking? At the end of March, when I checked my last set of tickets that I had bought for my last trip to Arizona and saw that I didn't win, any hope I had of becoming wealthy at a young age was finally and indefinitely shattered. It fully dawned on me that the life I had envisioned for myself would never come to pass. The children I would have in the future with a beautiful blonde girlfriend ceased to exist as if they were murdered. There won't be any beautiful blonde girlfriend for me now. No girl would be my girlfriend unless I had great wealth. I learned that from my life of being rejected. I was doomed to a life of lonely virginity. That is essentially the end of the lottery saga, which is pretty much the last notable thing Elliot did before his day of retribution. I'm going to read one more paragraph here. The spring of 2013 was also the time when I came across the website puahate.com. It is a forum full of men who are starved of sex, just like me. Many of them have their own theories of what women are attracted to, and many of them share my hatred of women, though unlike me, they would be too cowardly to act on it. Reading the posts on that website only confirmed many of the theories I had about how wicked and degenerate women really are. Most of the people on that website have extremely stupid opinions that I found very frustrating, but I found a few to be quite insightful. The website PUA Hate is very depressing. It shows just how bleak and cruel the world is due to the evilness of women. I tried to show it to my parents, to give them some sort of dose of reality as to why I'm so miserable. They never understood why I'm so miserable. They have always had the delusion that everything is going well for me, especially my father. When I sent the link of PUAHate.com to my parents, none of them even bothered to look at the posts on there. God, how many cries for help did he give his parents? PUA hate, of course, is part of the trinity of primordial incel sites, along with slut hate and lookism. His parents probably should have been more concerned over this. Instead, they seemed pretty blindsided by his manifesto and rushed down to Isla Vista. But it was too late, of course. Anyway, that's about all the time I have for you today. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you liked the video, please give it a like. If you have something to say about Elliot Roger or the content in general, let me hear it in the comments. Engagement is always good. Even dislikes are treated as positive by the algorithm. If you're new here, consider subscribing for more of the same and whatever Reddit stories I feel like talking about. I might also try some more Predator content. I couldn't keep my Lorne video monetized, but I get why. He's gross as hell. Big ups also to my awesome patrons who help keep me afloat with direct support over on Patreon. It's always a big help. We'll be back for the Day of Retribution as soon as I'm ready to cover Elliot again. Have a great day, everyone, and remember that when you're out with your girlfriend, there might be someone angrily staring at you the entire time. Weird thought.